Dobro došli u moj svet. Ja sam Vladan Vuletić, profesor fizike na MIT-u. Nauka je moj dragi prijatelj i dovela me iz Evrope u Boston, u Ameriku. Želim da vam pokažem čudesan svet nauke. Pođite sa mnom. I grew up in Pakistan, and I grew up in a, uh, in a middle-class family, and my, my parents actually very interestingly um, made many financial choices that were always in, in, the, in the direction of giving their children, I have an older sister and myself, an education. That was their priority. So uh, already when I was in, in, in school in Pakistan, I, I went to a, 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 very, a very good school there, uh, and sometime I would say sometime already by the time I was a teenager, there was talk in our house of going overseas for higher education, for college. And I think in part it was, it was driven by my mother wanting to create opportunity for her daughters that perhaps she herself didn't get of having higher education and building, building a career. So I went to a school where many kids go overseas for, for uh, higher ed. And so uh, I came here to the United States to go to college. Uh, and that, you know, if you, if I were to pinpoint one decision that really changed my life and my career, it was, uh, it was, the, it was getting a scholarship to come to the United States to go to college. So I went to college here at, at, at a college not far from MIT called Wellesley College. Uh, and, uh, and that was the first time whilst I was in college that I also got my first exposure to a research lab. And, and that's, I think, set the, the whole thing in motion, which was um, that, that hunger for discovery. And, and I have to say, you know, from the time I started college to the time I, I, I would, could be part of a, a really tremendous and, and significant discovery was almost 30 years. So it took a while to go from, from the, the dream of discovery to the actual realization. So my interest in gravitational waves was completely accidental. I didn't know anything about gravitational waves. I was actually a brand new graduate student at MIT, and I was looking for something interesting to, to, to work on. And I, quite by chance, I, I went to see uh, uh, a Professor Ray Weiss, who be eventually became my PhD advisor um, uh, uh, and you know my, my lifelong mentor. Uh, but I went to see him completely by accident, uh, just looking for something. I was like, okay, you know, I, I'm looking for a, a project. Do you have anything? And he told me, yeah, well, I'm working on this this gravitational wave things. I never heard about gravitational waves. I never, I didn't know anything about them. And at the time, this is in the early 1990s. Most people didn't, they, they actually, and so he told me what the project was, it was about LIGO, and he told me the precision that's needed to measure gravitational waves. And the precision that's needed is that what, what we were trying to do is, as the gravitational wave passes through the Earth, it moves dis, uh, the, the distances between objects, and in, in, the, in the case of LIGO, it moves the distance between mirrors. And the part that was really remarkable was that if you put two mirrors that are four kilometers away, when the gravitational wave passes by, they will move by one thousandth the, the diameter of a single proton. So that was the scale of the precision. So when he first told me about this, I thought he was completely crazy. I, I thought, I mean, how can anybody even dream of doing such a thing? And then I started to talk to my friends and you know here at the grad in graduate school and they were all like that, you know, stay away from this. This stuff was just, you know, never gonna work. But 
I couldn't stay away. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought if we could do this, the, it would be really amazing for two reasons. The one was it's a precision that, that humans have never reached before. And then it would allow us to measure some, a, 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 you know, a, a part of the universe that we have never been able to before. Because net gravitational waves had never been measured before. No one had even conceived that it could be possible. In fact, Einstein, when he first, Einstein was the one who, who, who first you know, told us gravitational waves exist. It, they, it came out of his theory of general relativity, which is a theory of gravity. And when he saw gra these gravitational waves, these waves pop out of his equations, he was really very skeptical. He was skeptical whether they were even exist at all. Are there these waves? And if they were there, he actually eventually decided they would be useless. They wouldn't be useful for anything because they were so weak, so faint. So here we are, uh, you know, a hundred years after Einstein told us they would never be useful having made the discovery. But that, the, the discovery was set in motion in the 1970s and 80s by Ray Weiss and, 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 and other colleagues. Uh, and so when I joined his group in the 1990s, it was seen as something one shouldn't do. But I, I'll, I'll just say, you know, in fact, that's exactly the reason to do something is because it may be very difficult, but it can lead us to something incredibly profound and, and important. So, you know, LIGO and, and, and the kind of work I do has, has, is part of a large collaboration. In fact, those, uh, those first discovery papers had a thousand scientists on there, and you can, it's hard to kind of imagine what it feels like to be part of such a, a, a large team. But really, in the end, it's, it's the work that we do is much more in smaller teams. And then the, the work of smaller teams comes together in, in, a, in the larger context. So, so my everyday work is really with you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 people. Uh, and uh, the, way that, the way that that works is we, each of us, are aware that the whole ship only moves forward if we each pull on our own oar as hard as we can. So your part matters. That's the most important thing to know about working in a big project is that everybody's part matters in, in, the, um, in achieving the goal. So LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So they're very you know, big, long words, but ultimately you can think of LIGO as a telescope. But mostly, when, when, you know, telescopes, when we use, use them, they're, what they're used for is collecting light from the distant universe, from stars, from galaxies, but light. LIGO is a telescope that's used for, for detecting gravitational waves. So instead of light waves that come from stars, in, uh, what LIGO is trying to do was is trying to do is measure gravitational waves that also come from stars, but in, in, in some rather special and unique stars. So, gravitational waves are the gravitational waves uh, are emitted uh, due to an object's gravity or mass. So you can just think of anything that's heavy that has mass in the universe and moves around is going to emit gravitational waves. So why is that so, 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 so special? It's very special because we know that in the universe there are objects that have a lot of mass and therefore gravity, but they don't emit light. Now if we want to learn about those objects and we want to understand what they are, we have to find some other messenger because light is, just, is not bringing us that information. A very good example of that is black holes, right? Black holes are called black holes because they are black they don't give off light, but they have a lot of gravity, and they give off gravitational waves. Uh, now, you might ask, well, why should we bother to study black holes? So first of all, I mean, they're amazing and wonderful. Who doesn't love a black hole, right? I mean, you throw something at the black hole, and it gobbles it up. But even more fundamental than that, we know that black holes are the building blocks of our universe. Without black holes, we couldn't put the universe together that we live in. So we should know, know something about them. So if you want to know something about black holes and they don't give off light, 
you have to use the messenger that they do uh, send their information with, and that's gravitational waves. So LIGO was conceived as, a, a, as an instrument, like a telescope, to detect these gravitational waves from the collisions of black holes. Uh, and to, to do that, because we've all heard at some point or the other that gravity is a very weak force. We don't really agree with that in our everyday life, because when we jump up, my goodness, we get pulled right back down. We can't jump very high because of gravity. But then you can ask the question of, well, why don't we just, when we jump up and we fall back down to the Earth, why don't we just fall all the way down to the center of the Earth, which is the, 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 the point where gravity is, 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 is focused. The reason we don't do that is because all the other forces, in particular electromagnetic forces, are making, are stopping us on the ground. So that's really why, so gravity is very weak, and so gravitational waves are very weak. And that's why Einstein thought they would never be useful. So now comes what's the achievement of LIGO. So the achievement of LIGO is that to measure these very faint gravitational waves, you take mirrors that are four kilometers apart, and you make them so, so still. So you have to protect them from all the forces on the Earth that make them move so that they only move when the gravitational wave comes by. And that motion is about a thousandth the size of a single proton. So that's really the, the, the achievement as an instrument for LIGO is how do you make mirrors so still and then measure such tiny motions. So there's lots of technology that goes into that, but once you've done that technology, then comes the next achievement which is the, the actual measurement of gravitational waves the, and the discoveries. And so in, in, you know, LIGO had been going in different phases for, for since about 2000 as an instrument. And then in 2015, was the, we completed a, a major upgrade to it. And pretty much as soon as the first phase of that upgrade was done, we turned on the instrument, we made our first discovery. So what did we see? We saw the collision of two black holes. And these black holes were a, over a billion light years away. So this is the most amazing, remarkable thing to think about, which is that these two black holes, they collided with each other a billion years ago. And those waves were traveling through the universe. And then eventually, they hit our instruments, the LIGO and Virgo instruments. And there, we were able to record these bumps and wiggles of the space time itself. And that was the, the, the first signals. And what we saw were two black holes that collided. We could tell how far they were. We could tell how heavy they were. We could tell how fast they were, they were going. And that sort of set off a, a really a whole a new, completely new way of doing astronomy, right? We have now seen you know, waves that come from gravity instead of light. I, 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 with gravitational waves, okay. so with gravitational waves, I like to think of this the way that we might think of Galileo and, and, and the first telescope. So we believe Galileo was the first person to point a telescope at the sky in 1609. And you know, today, 400 years later, we, most people don't remember or are not impressed by what Galileo saw through his telescope, because we have so much, so much more powerful telescopes now. But the thing, so it's not what Galileo saw that was so important today, you know, historically. But the thing that he did was he did a paradigm shift for humanity, because it was the first time that humans understood that if you use an instrument to look at the sky instead of using your naked eyes, you can see more. And from then on, you know, from Galileo's little one and a half inch telescope, we have now, you know, now we're building, you know, we have eight meter scale telescopes. We're building 20 and 30 meter scale telescopes and we can look out to the edge of the observable universe. And Galileo could only look at our own solar system. So really the way to think about this is, is the paradigm shift. You know, we, are, we as humans, as long as, as, as humans have, have, have recorded history, we've been fascinated with the sky. And that fascination has come because our eyes can see starlight. But, and, and then Galileo made the, the paradigm shift that you don't just need your eyes. You can have 
you can use instruments. And now we're making this new paradigm shift, which is you don't just use light, which your eyes can see, but you can use gravity and gravitational waves, which we can't feel, they're too faint, but our instruments can measure, and therefore we can see the universe in a different way. Yeah, uh, uh, so part of my work uh, that, you know, in, with LIGO has been to ask the question, what is the limit to the precision of measurements? And in our case, the measurement we're trying to make is the motion of a particle. In our case, the particle happens to be a mirror. So what's the limit to, to the precision which, which you can make that measurement? What's the smallest motion you could measure? And to answer that question, you intrinsically you have to confront quantum mechanics. And the reason you have to do that, we all know that quantum mechanics is, is, the, is, the, is, is the physical uh, description of things at the atomic scale, at very, very small scales. Now the mirrors of LIGO are not atomic at all. They're huge. In fact, they're you know, 35 centimeters in diameter and they weigh 40 kilograms. But because we make them so, so still, because their motion is so small, then we have to confront you know, the, the uh, quantum mechanics. And the other part of LIGO, the L in LIGO stands for laser, and that's light, laser light. And light, we know, is also quantized. Light comes as, as particles called photons. And our measurement involves counting photons. How many photons we count tells us how much the mirrors move. And quantum mechanics tells us that you can never count the number of photons with perfect precision you always have quantum uncertainty. So that's really why quantum mechanics is such an important part of, the, of, of LIGO and the experiments that we do. And so the work that we're trying to do is we're actually trying to, to if you will, uh, trick quantum mechanics. You can never, you can never violate quantum mechanics because that's a fundamental law of nature, but you can trick it a little bit. So what we, what we, what we do is we, we actually create in our labs, and in fact in the lab right here, we create uh, uh, sp specially engineered uh, light in which the quantum uncertainty is, is made lower, it's reduced. Now you'll say, well that violates quantum mechanics because you've just told me it's a fundamental limit. And the way we get around that is we move quantum uncertainty from a quantity that we are measuring into another quantity that we're not measuring. And that's the key thing. Quantum mechanics allows you to move uncertainty between quantities, but it never allows you to reduce it altogether uh, on its own. So I'll give you an, an, an analogy. So that this, this, uh, this technology that we use is called squeeze states of light. And it was invented, um, uh, the idea was invented b back in the 1970s and early 80s. But it, you know, it took about 25 years before we had technologies where it was reasonable to try to do this uh, in, in a lab. But what we do is we create what's called squeeze states of light. And what that really means is we're moving uncertainty in, in the arrival time of photons. We take that uncertainty and make it smaller, but we make the energy of the photons larger. So let me give an analogy, because that's really you know, pretty hard to wrap your head around. Suppose I give you a piece of paper. And I tell you to measure the length of this piece of paper. So you would do what any reasonable person does. You would get a ruler and you would measure it. But now imagine that your ruler was limited by quantum uncertainty, which means that the tick marks on your, on your ruler, they jitter ever so slightly. And the height of the tick marks also jitters. That's what quantum uncertainty does. So now you try to measure your piece of paper and you can't make a good measurement because the, the spacing of your tick marks is, is, is moving on you. So imagine now you made a squeeze state of that ruler. Then what would happen is, what we would do is we would make the uncertainty in the spacing between the tick marks smaller. So they become more stable, but we make the, 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 the fluctuations in the height of the tick marks larger. So they move to change by a lot. But to measure the piece of paper, you don't care about the height of the tick marks. You care about the spacing between the tick marks. So now you make a more precise measurement. That's what we do. So that's, a, that's how we create, we create these squeeze states of light. And we use them in LIGO to make the measurement, um, uh, the instrument more precise. And what does that allow us to do? That allows us to see gravitational waves 
from farther away or from fainter sources. So you know, if, 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 if the source is not very bright in gravitational waves, you would, you would have to have a better instrument. And that's what it allows us to do. So one of the technologies that's related to gravitational wave detectors and, and, and LIGO is, and related to this fundamental question of what is the limit to precision is how do you make an object sit still, right? Because one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to take objects and, and keep them in a, in a particular location more precisely. And so a technology that's been used very successfully to do that with atoms is something called laser cooling. And really what it, it's, a, it's a, the idea is, is, is that you shine uh, a laser light at, at, at an atom, and that laser light can be used, if you, if you carefully arrange it, to remove energy from the atom. And when you remove kinetic energy, it slows down and gets, gets, you know, gets more, more still. And so we, in my labs, uh, in, in, over the years, we've tried to use these same ideas, but instead of a single atom or a small group of atoms, to do it for very large objects, mirrors, and even the size of, of, of coins, and, 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 and even larger. And, and so the, the idea is very much the same. You use, uh, laser light can exert a force. That's something that people don't really appreciate. Light exerts a force. If I had a big enough laser and, and, and I shine it at you, you will topple over, okay? So light exerts a force, and we use that force in, in carefully engineered ways to actually uh, uh, slow down and, and, and make mirrors more still and therefore cool and trap them. Cooling simply means that we've taken away some of their heat energy, their energy, and that makes them slow down. And so, so that's a technology that, that we've developed here, in part you know, inspired by LIGO, but also uh, has applications out, outside of, uh, of, of LIGO in uh, in, in, in a ver variety of areas, but the part that I'm interested in, again, comes back to that fundamental question of the limits to precision. So, you know, we're 100 years after Einstein told us gravitational waves exist. It took us the first 100 years to, to build an instrument precise enough to make the first discoveries. Now, since those first detections, we have already detected uh, a, a, a couple of dozen other uh, um, events of black holes colliding and there's lighter cousins of black holes called neutron stars and when they collide they have given up gravitational waves and we're learning about about these kinds of objects black holes and neutron stars the future is is inevitably about building more powerful instruments and looking further out into the universe and I think the most exciting thing that could happen in this field, a newly born field of gravitational wave astronomy, would be to our instruments will pick up some signal and we have no idea what it is. Something completely new, unthought of, unimagined. And astronomy has a history of doing that because every time we've built a new instrument targeted at some particular kind of object in the sky, we have discovered objects we didn't expect to see. So, so that's, I think, that's, the, that's how the history of discovery has gone, and I expect it to go the same for, for gravitational waves. So I would say, coming back to the idea of where we are 400 years after Galileo, where you know, we've, we've more or less been able to observe you know, light in different colors out to the edge of the observable universe, I think that's where we want to go with gravitational waves as well, to build more powerful instruments and to look out into the universe and unlock her secrets. So I, I actually uh, uh, don't have a direct collaboration with Vladen, but our work has many, many areas of of connection and, 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 and overlap in, a, in, a, in an interesting and different kind of way. So for example, uh, you know, one of the things in my group, we, we've been working on, on making these squeeze states of light. And we make these squeeze states of light so we can make a more precise measurement with laser light 
in, in, our, uh, in LIGO. Vladan actually works uh, with making squeeze states as well, but he squeezes uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the properties of, of, of atoms. So he makes uh, squeezed spin states. And spins are a property of, 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 of atoms. And he does that to make more precise measurements of the properties of, of atomic systems. So this idea, these ideas that we have and the technologies that we use have lots of, of overlap. And the, the work that goes on in Laudan's group is also very fundamental in, in nature in the sense that, that he is trying to understand the, the behavior uh, of, of atoms and the collective behaviors of atoms. You know, when you put many atoms together, they behave differently when you have just one atom. He's trying to understand how those, those properties can, uh, can be used actually eventually in, in applications as well. And so our work, uh, I, 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 I love to say, so we both have, uh, we both, our work broadly speaking is in an area of physics called atomic molecular and optical physics. It's called AMO physics. And I, and, I, and, I, and I sometimes joke with Vlad and that I do AMO without the A and the M, because we don't use atoms and molecules. We use light. And he uses light and atoms and molecules. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's the place where we have. If I went into, in, 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 into his lab, many of the things on his apparatus would be very familiar to me and vice versa. So. So MIT is, is, is an incredibly special place because of the students. So some, if you ask, you know, yes, we have brilliant people here, faculty, researchers, and that's fantastic. But none of this would be possible if we didn't have the students that we do. So at a university, as opposed to a research center or a lab, the biggest sort of asset we have as students. And so uh, part of what I love about MIT is my colleagues and the ability. I, I, I can't tell you how often I get stuck on a problem. I'm trying to solve something that I don't know how to solve. And all I have to do is think about who else at MIT would, might know the answer. And I can, I can you know, drop them an email and say, I'm stuck on this. Can I talk to you for a few minutes? And quickly, I will get a, a response saying, sure, come along. And I can solve my problems. And so, you can imagine how, how that speeds up your research because you don't get stuck for days or weeks on a, on a problem. You go find someone who's an expert and they help you out. So that's the research side. Now comes the, the student part. When the students are, are, are sort of, they, are, they ask such ridiculous questions that you have to think deeply about it. And I mean ridiculous in the best possible way. Deep questions, things you haven't thought about. And so it makes you also very, uh, always thinking about things deeper than you might otherwise think. And, and so one of my roles at MIT is I'm the associate head of, of the physics department. Uh, and, and, and that specifically uh, 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 makes me responsible for all the stu physics students. And so about 500 students, gradu undergraduates and graduates. And, I am responsible for thinking about their education, the curriculum, their well-being. And it's a, it's, a, it's a role that I greatly enjoy because of this appreciation that I have that our research at a university could not be possible without the, the full participation of students. You know, there are many open mysteries in the universe right now. We're at a rather an incredible time where, where you know, there are I, these unknown forces like dark energy that we don't know what it is. We know it's there because we can measure its effects. We don't know what it is. Dark matter, which is, you know, matter we know that has gravity but it has no other interactions with light that we can see, things like that. These are big, profound questions, but I'll tell you the one that drives me, and that, that's the, the one that I've carried from childhood, which is the question of, you know, how did it all begin? Where do we come from? And, and so, uh, so we know now from observations that, that there was a Big Bang, 
and the uni universe began in, in, in this spectacular bang. And then there was this period in which the universe expanded very quickly. And eventually, it grew and ballooned to be the universe we see today. Now, when we look back at the universe, when, and when looking back in time is, is in the universe is simply the same as looking far in distance. Right? So when we look farther, far enough out in distance or back in time with light, though we get stuck at seeing the universe when it was about 400,000 years old. Because before that, when the universe was younger than that, it was so hot and dense that the light didn't escape. It would just keep getting, uh, you know, keep colliding with atoms and, 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 and um, matter and was stuck. So what happened in those first 400,000 years? We don't know. We can't see because light can't tell us the, that. So how could we find out? And it turns out that gravitational waves were already streaming towards us from the, the, the earliest moments of the Big Bang because light was getting stuck because of all the matter and particles. Gravitational waves go through matter. So they've been streaming at us. So if we want to know what happened in those first 400,000 years, we should try to measure those gravitational waves from the early, early universe. And it's really hard. They're really faint. But that would be. So for me, you know, if that happened in my, my lifetime, my goodness, it would be a life well lived, at least scientifically. <laughs>